So I apologise at the beginning because I forgot a jacket and I forgot my shoes. I'm wearing training <laughs> shoes. Not, not really the right thing to wear for a very important meeting. And of course, this is a very important meeting. And I am purely a spokesman. You're the people who do the hard work out there. You're the people who do the day-to-day -day looking after children um, with diabetes. And what I'm going to focus on today is the two spotlight audits, which we published um, last year now. Um, and towards the end of the presentation, I'm going to show you what you've all done for 1918-2019. So let's start with this infamous slide, if you like, that goes up to 2017-18. This is the median HbA1c uh, since 2005-06 right up to 2017-18. And as Russell said, back in 2010, we weren't going anywhere fast. The average H1C was 73, uh, and it was round about that time that a lot of people got together and said, we can't carry on like this. And so a whole series of um, high-level strategies were put into place to try and improve uh, care for children with diabetes, because we were way behind some of our colleagues in Sweden and Germany, and we'll hear a little bit about that um, later. So the first thing that happened was disclosure back in 2010. So we named and shamed, if you like, if another word, every unit was disclosed in the national audit. You knew what your average was, you knew what your neighbour's average H1C was. Uh, and I think that was a big move, and, and we've continued with that, and it's very important that you're able to compare yourself against somebody else. And then uh, in England was the, was the regional networks uh, uh, became into existence here, and then lots of money got thrown at you in England. I don't work in England, I work in Wales. Um, but we followed a bit later in Wales with money that comes through a slightly different process um, to, tr to tariff. And then the painful quality assurance peer review came along, which we're still participating in now. And it is a painful process, but it, but it works, uh, and uh, it makes your centre better in the long run. And then there were delivery plans published, and the and the new delivery plans are in the process of being um, sorted now. And then Wales, we followed a little bit behind you, did in England. Uh, and then we started to move now into this sort of quality improvement, quality assurance era, and technologies are, are, are taking off. So you can see there's this, been this massive change in H1C over the last uh, 10 years. But we have plateaued after, over the last um, three years. And at the end, I'm going to show you where we are now. But of course, um, those are average H1Cs for the whole nation, nations, England and, and Wales. And we know there's a lot of variability. So this is now the famous funnel plot. I hope people are familiar with funnel plots now. So each of these dots represents a, one of the 174 centres in England and Wales. The dark blue ones are the Wales ones, and the light blue are the England ones. And what we've plotted here is your adjusted H1C, so that takes into account your uh, case mix that you have within your units, it takes into account ethnicity, um, uh, uh, your um, deprivation uh, based on your postcode, gender, age, lots of things in there, but it only actually accounts for 10% of that variability. And we plot that against the size of your, your centre along the bottom here. So statistically, and I'm no statistician, as your centre gets bigger, you should regress towards the average line, which is this big one in the middle. And you can build this funnel around it to say whether you're in keeping um, with uh, other centres around the country. And so we can define the so-called horrible negative outliers up here. So these are the units that aren't doing quite as well as certainly these ones that sit within the funnel. And these ones are the very positive uh, um, centres doing extremely well. And nobody likes receiving that letter uh, from Holly in the college to say that you are a negative outlier and you have to go and speak to your chief executive. So we're constantly trying to um, reduce that variability that you see, quite a massive variability, and so that ev wherever you go for your diabetes care, you'll get pretty much the same service and you should achieve um, the best possible target for you. And so in the audit, we try to use the data that you give us to present back to you in formats that you can utilise for your quality uh, improvement. And there are a number of reports that we produce for you. So this is the main... Um, annual report, the, the core report, sometimes um, call it. We changed the front cover after nearly eight years of that little girl on the front with the pen. 
Uh, we changed it last year for the, for the first time for a long time, and this was actually designed by uh, a patient. And then there's this report, which is not is small in size on my slide, but this is the parent report. So all we've done is condense everything that's in here down into this report to make it a little bit easier to read. So it's a parent and care, pet carer report. But I understand actually a lot of people in the room prefer that report to the main core report, and there's nothing wrong with that uh, at all. And then we provide for you a unit level report. So this compares yourself with yourself over the years that you've been participating, also compares you against uh, other centres. And there's a lot of information there. And when you receive that report, you should scrutinise it quite carefully, talk about it in your MTT, use it as ways that you can quality uh, improve. And you can also go online and get more information from the online tool, and you can compare yourself to other uh, centres. As you know, we've run a, uh, a patient-reported experience measure for some years now. The latest one is in analysis now, uh, and we should get that out to you as uh, soon as possible. We also link to the adult audit for a transition audit. Hopefully some of you have looked at that, and Fiona and I and some others in the room were at a transition QI day yesterday about how we can work better with our adult colleagues. Uh, and then there's the admissions uh, audit, and we're in the pro we do these every three years, and we're in the process of analysing or collecting that data now and linking it to HES and the PEDU data in Wales. And then over here are the two spotlight audits, which I'm going to talk more in, in detail. So a spotlight is exactly as it says. You take a light and you shine it on a specific aspect of the service, and we went out to you and asked you as centres... Uh, um, how many staff you had, how many people you had on pumps, and then we brought that all together into a nice uh, report. So I'm going to start with the workforce uh, uh, spotlight order, order. And the reason we chose this one, because some of you may have read and recall that um, the Child Policy Research Unit, who've been doing quite a lot of research with the MPDA, published uh, this in 2017, this report, Report, uh, of a staff uh, survey. It was actually based on where we were in 2014. So we thought this would be a great opportunity to go from 2014 to 2018 and see where we were in terms of staffing levels. So this is the information you get, get gave us back. This was, this was 2014, actually. So this was the whole time equivalent healthcare professionals. So that's everyone, doctors, nurses, dieticians, youth worker, whatever you are, if you were involved in the care of children with diabetes, you were counted as, a, as an equivalent, whether you were part-time, that was taken into account. So these are the whole-time equivalent staff, that's a 10-session, so 37 and a half hour week, caring for children and young people with diabetes. Uh, and the graphs here are per thousand children, and, and these are by networks. And you see, back in 2014, there was actually quite a lot of variability across the networks in terms of um, those staffing levels. And in Wales, where I live, we were particularly badly off, but this, um, this uh, predates us getting money uh, in Wales to improve um, the service. So where are we in 2018? So what I've just done is to add on to those, the red areas, which is where the increase. So every network has increased, and in Wales, in fact, we have one of the biggest uh, increases of any of the networks, but every centre's increased. So we're now running, have, have moved from about 25 whole-time equivalents to now being more just over about the 30 uh, mark per 1,000 children with diabetes. Of course, how you, how you break down that staff is very much up to you in terms of nurses and dietitians, and I was going to ask for a show of hands, but Fiona's already done that. And this, is, this, this graph is just splitting it down to the various healthcare professionals. It's probably representative of that show of hands that we just saw. So about half of the healthcare professionals are, are nurses, and that's what most people would think. Uh, and then we move lesser um, dietitians... Uh, and then we move into doctors out here, about, nearly about four whole-time equivalents. Uh, and then we're out to psychologists, and then we're out into educators and youth workers. Don't actually appear, they're so small, they don't actually appear on these um, charts. And we saw that from the show of hands. So is that, are we now in a position to say we've got enough staff? 
because lots of people say, well, the reason I can't do this, I can't run a punch service or I can't do this is because I haven't got enough staff to do it. Well, there is some guidance out there. If you go to ISPAD recommendations, the International Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology recommendations per thousand children with diabetes is you should have 10 nurses, five dietitians, 10 consultants, and three psychologists. That's 28. Okay, so I just said we were approaching nearly 35. So we are actually well over that. The difference we have is that we have far less doctors involved in that breakdown than, they did, than the recommendation. As you can see, 10, a ratio of one to one almost for nurses, for doctors, and I don't think most centres would have that. So in reality, if you look at our population, which is, for England and Wales, about 28,000 children under the age of 16 with type one diabetes, we should have 784 health, whole time equivalent healthcare professional, professionals, and we actually have 823. So we're actually quite well resourced now. So I think rather than keep focusing maybe on business cases to get more and more staff, we need to focus a little bit more on how we use those staff to improve. And that's borne out a little bit by this correlation between, um, again, case mix adjusted H1C and the whole time equivalent staff you have in your uh, clinic. So you might expect if you've got more staff, you might do better. But in fact, there is absolutely no correlation. See, that's almost a straight line, and it's all mixed all over the place. So you appear to be do it, can do it uh, equally as well with a small number of whole time equivalent professionals as you can with a, with a large number. So I think it's about how you use your staff rather than um, constantly calling out for more staff. I'm not saying you shouldn't ask more staff if you need them. So in that workforce survey, we've also looked at various other things that are going on around the country that might help you with that work workforce. So we look at the best tar tariff. Now, I'm one of those people who's also very jealous of your tariff because I live across the border and we don't have it. Um, but for you in England, there are 161 of you in, in England centres um, that should be entitled to having tariff. And when we asked about that, Surprisingly, there are some that are still not getting tariff, some that don't know that they're getting um, tariff. And of those who, who said no, um, some of them really didn't know whether they were ever going to get it or when they were expected to start it. So a lot of you are getting it uh, here, so 145 are getting tariff, but most are getting around about 40% of what you should actually be getting it. Getting. Again, there's a whole range from some saying none to 100%. But quite a lot of people don't even know how much they're getting. Down, right down the bottom here, 100 and, I can't quite read that, 105 centres don't actually know how much of the tariff they're entitled to they're actually getting. So I would go and speak to your managers and ask them, say, you, get, you should be able to get this huge amount of uh, money. Uh, where is it? Structured education. So structured education, and this is a rather pleasing statistic, 98% now of centres are delivering structured education programmes at diagnosis. Um, and just over half of those were locally developed programmes. About 16% were using the goals of diabetes. In Wales, we use the SEREN programme, and there are some centres in England that use that as well. This predates DAP, and I know some of you will be using DAP as well, so this was in 2018, so that will have changed slightly. But although people are delivering those programmes, very few people know whether their programme is quality assured or are doing any quality assurance around that programme. So you might be delivering something which actually doesn't work. I suspect that's not right, not, uh, that's wrong, but I would encourage you to think about how you quality assure your programme. It's not easy to do but it is worth um, doing. Transition. So transition to young adult service, and we all sit there and think sometimes it's quite a good thing to get rid of some of your offenders, if you like, off your, your books. It might bring down your average H1C. But we were at a meeting yesterday, Fiona and I, and several others, about how we need to work more, much more closely uh, with the young adult service, services. And there may, in the future, be tariff even up to the age of 25. Certainly, if Fiona gets away, there definitely will be. <laughs> and and um, the NHS plan certainly has in it about joined up services right up to the age of 25. So, so um, I, th I think it probably will come uh, eventually. 
So 173 centres. Um, uh, it's good to see that a lot of them have now some dedicated transition clinics. Most, most of them are still one or two who, who don't. Uh, and, but how people get into those clinics are mostly now by uh, a gradual process over a year or two, which is good to see, and that's what the standards tell us. But there are still some who are being transferred by direct transfer. I don't think that's a very good uh, way of some handing some of the, uh, from a young person, from a paediatric into a young person's um, uh, clinic um, should be. So there's still some variability across the country in how that's managed. You will be very familiar with the additional vulnerabilities um, Children who children in need, ch child protect, children on child protection plans and child protection registers, and the looked after children. And we know that from the data we've taken, there is an excess of that amongst children with diabetes. That maybe just because we go looking for it a little bit more. But we look over here. So th these these um, numbers are taken at the rate per 10,000 children, young people, uh, managed in a diabetes centre against those in the general population. So for the child protection register, so there's almost a doubling of children with diabetes on the child protection. And that presents quite a lot of work for you. And I, in my own centre, I always think we have about 10 children that take up about 90% of the nurse's time. And I can see lots of people nodding at that around the, around the audience, and that's probably true. Staff vacancies. There's lots of staff vacancies. One in three centres reported at least one vacancy, and that's the numbers that are sitting around the country and, and filled. Um, some, of it, some of it's about the fact that there aren't people out there to actually get. In my own centre, I have two consultant vacancies. I can't actually find anyone. There is, aren't people trained out there to, to fill them. Uh, it's the same with PDSN. So you need to think about how you bring people succession plan and bring people into your teams um, early on so they can then move into the full jobs when they become available. And a lot of these posts have been um, vacant for at least three months. Uh, administrators, we had some administrators in, in the room, which is good to see, but um, a lot of us don't have any dedicated administrative staff. Uh, uh, two thirds have no dedicated data assistant or clinical audit um, support staff, including myself. I do it, but I'm just a bit of a geek. I'm quite interested in the data, so I do it myself. And where, if you want a benchmark of where you should be, so where data support staff do exist, somewhere about a half time equivalent, two and a half days a week. So that's why you should be pitching your business case, probably. So there were some recommendations came out of that, out of that workshop, or, uh, out of the workforce audit. So the first, the best practice tariff, all centres need to be aware of how this valuable resource is being used and where it's with less than 100%, um, you need to be in discussions with your senior management. A no-brainer. Service specifications for sounds of children and people undergoing transposition have been published numerous times, actually. There are several of them out there. There's Welsh ones, and there's English ones, and there's Scottish ones. There's lots of them out there. And we should follow that guidance. Uh, and this is now being measured, as you'll be aware, in the Quality Assurance um, Programme. Children where people are twice as likely to be on a child protection register, and you need to just think how, how, how you have robust policies around non-attendance and consider appointing social workers within the MDT, and that's certainly a recommendation from the International Society for Paediatric and Adolescent Diabetes. You need administrative staff if you're going to, to continue to um, submit good data to the, the audit. And... I think you need to explore how you use your staff uh, optimally. If any, I'm sure lots of you have been on, on the quality program. There's, there's lots of stuff in there about QI and how you might think about changing the way you use your staff to be more effective. Uh, and I think everyone should participate in the, in the college uh, diabetes quality um, program. And 90% now are signed up to doing that. So I'm going to turn now to the technologies Still got time. Um, I always have Holly glaring at me. And I turn to the technologies audit. So the tech, we, we decided to do this 
to look at the prevalence and use of diabetes related technology because as you know there's been an explosion of this over the last few years and see whether we can establish some relationship between the use of those technologies and outcomes particularly around HbA1c and I do tend to focus on HbA1c I know there are lots of other outcomes to diabetes but it is the marker that relates to future risk of problems. So I'm going to talk about uh, multiple daily injections, pumps, uh, use of freestyle Libra, flash glucose monitoring, uh, and um, CGM, and the combination of those uh, things together, either MDI and CGM or pumps and um, CGM. So let's start by looking at the increasing usage of pumps. So in orange are the pumps, in the uh, blue are multiple daily injections. Uh, and these are split into age groups. So the top age group is the under fours, then we've got the five to nines, 10 to 14s, and the uh, 15s uh, and over. And as you can see, over the last four years, there's been a gradual increase in pump usage. Uh, in 2018-19, we were running at about 35 to 40% on average across the, the country, uh, and the reciprocal reduction in uh, MDI. And again, it's the younger age groups who are using this the most, and I'm sure you'll be familiar with that with your own um, services. But there is variability in who gets a pump. If you break this down by uh, ethnic minority status, you can see here the white Caucasian children around about 38% on a pump, uh, about 10% less in Asian children and black um, uh, minority status children. So that's something we need to think about. Are we offering that equally to every child who has diabetes or are we being selective? This is deprivation quintile. So we take your post, the postcode of the patient and you convert that into a deprivation index using the multiple index of deprivation published by the gov various um, governments. So again, you can see this um, correlation uh, between these children living in the most deprived areas to the least deprived areas, and you're much more likely to be on a pump if you live in a less deprived area than you are in the most deprived areas. So we just need to also think about, are we being selective, and is that us thinking about how we should select children, or is there a better way of doing that? My feeling is that any child should potentially be offered the use of technologies such as this. And the other worrying thing is that difference between the least and most deprived seems to be getting bigger. So we just focus on the orange line. These are children on pumps. And the top line here is the least deprived children. These are the most deprived children. So it's going up in, in both of them. But back in 2014 and 15, there was about an 8% gap. It's now 12%. So we just need to watch that, that we're not um, selecting children correctly. There is, of course, a, a huge variation across the, pump, the country in the pump usage. So these are all the centres lined up in this caterpillar plot. Uh, there's the average use of pumps, around about 35%. Um, this is, these are Wales units. I can do that because that's me in the middle there. My red, we're, I'm around about on the average line. And the blues are the other centres in Wales. But you can see across the whole of England and Wales, there's quite a variability from centres down here, hardly with anyone on a pump, to up here in excess of 80% uh, uh, being on pump. And I expect we'll hear from Gunn later that in Sweden that's about 80%, 70%, 80%. Um, there's quite a variability in, in how long it takes to get onto a pump. Uh, this is broken down by country or by uh, region. I'm, I'm ashamed to say in Wales that um, you know, some of our children are waiting over six months. I think that's resolving now, but back a year ago, they were waiting over six months. But in the majority of networks, most are waiting over at least three months before the decision is made to go onto a pump and actually the day you start it. And that's too long. Does having a pump make any difference in terms of achieving um, an HB1C um, target? And this, this is interesting um, data, because if we look down here, so that, again, pumps, people on pumps are in the orange, people on MDR are in the blue. So come down here to the best achievers, the less than 48 HB1C, really not much difference whether you're on a pump uh, or you're on a 
uh, an MDI. And that's the same for when you get up to about 53. And then you start to see the parting of the ways when you get up to 58. So you're more likely to achieve an H1C under 58 if you're on a, an insulin pump. And then if you move up into the higher brackets, you're going up to 69, 75, and 80 up here, you're much more likely to be on MDI. So pumps tend to certainly help those in the higher um, uh, target brackets and bring them down into this less than 58. But our pumps, uh, and, and, and this is where I get confused about some of this data, because you might say there should be a great correlation between um, average H1C in a unit and the percentage of people who are on a pump. But as you can see, there's huge variability. So this is, uh, again, adjusted H1C up here against the percentage of people within your centre on a pump. And there is a small correlation. Look at that p-value is just below 0 0.05. Um, but the R squared is accounting for about 3% of the variability. So it's very, very small. So I think we've got a lot of work still to do about how you use pumps. And I've heard it said about, uh, from other European countries about us in the UK that you don't use pumps correctly. <coughs> and I think we probably are guilty of that because that sh we shouldn't be having that variability that we see um, there. And in fact, if you look at this, this graph, that just... Um, it says more or less the same thing. So again, these are the centres here, each one of these little grey dots, the centres um, lined up for HB1, average H1C, and these reds are those that tell us they've got more than 50% of their patients on a pump. And you might expect them to be all down this end, but they're not. You can see they're spread right across the piece uh, there. So for every centre, so now come down to the centre level, um, what is the difference between those on pumps and those who have um, multiple daily injections? So the blue line in the middle here is the average H1C for the centre, as you see in that ca like the caterpillar plot. And then we've broken it down here into um, the green being those on multiple daily injections and the red being those on uh, insulin pumps. And you can see there's quite a difference between the pump, those on pumps and those on MDI. And where the big area where it parts the waves, if you like, is right in the middle. So these are the middle performers, if you like, those sitting in the middle of that funnel plot. There's quite a difference in, in your pump patients compared to your, um, your MDI patients. And interesting, down this end of the graph, you start seeing them coming together. So those centres that are performing really well actually perform almost equally well for their pumpers or their uh, MDI. So they may be doing something different to people uh, up here. And I would encourage you to go and visit some of them and see how they run their, their services. So CGM, just uh, so I've done the pumps, move on to the CGM. Uh, again, this is exploding. I mean, this is a data from a year ago showing the, the uh, percentage of children who were using CGM. And lo and behold, Yorkshire and Humber, I think that's you, Fiona, you've got a lot of people on CGM. You were the outlier there, if you like, with 16% of children. I suspect these numbers are much bigger now than they were a year ago. There's been quite an explosion of the use of uh, CGM. Um, but again, huge variability uh, across the, the country, some not using CGM at all, and some with... Um, quite large numbers of their children um, using uh, CGM. And if you look at Freestyle Libra, we've only got the data on the usage of C Freestyle Libra, we can't link it to HB1C, but you can see quite a variability uh, across the two nations uh, in terms of who is using Freestyle Libra. But if you look at, if you, and this is by network now, so if you look, just look by network and you divide CGM against uh, uh, non-CGM uh, users, you can see the CGM users, which are in the light green, uh, are all achieving better HB1Cs than those with, okay, I can see your five-minute sign, I'm nearly there, nearly there, uh, achieving slightly better H1Cs than those who are not using um, CGM. So then that's where you have to get a lovely statistician involved, because this goes beyond me, is to say, well, if you put all those things into a model, um, does the use of CGM or pumps or combinations of those uh, make any difference? So I always hate it when people put up these slides because I never know where I'm meant to look. So don't look anywhere yet because I'm going to focus you on a certain bit of it. So 
just enlarge this bit up the top here. So this is comparing. So you compared, you have to take a, um, a point in the sand somewhere. So this is comparing to children who are just using MDI alone. So if you add a CGM into your MGI, you might hope to improve h c on average by 2.5 millimoles. If you go onto a pump not using CGM, you have an even bigger uh, improvement of about 5 millimoles difference. And if you add the CGM onto the pump, you get about another one and a bit uh, millimoles. And these are all highly significant uh, with quite tight confidence in intervals. So there's certainly some evidence that using pumps and CGM um, together will make quite a big difference. Interestingly, if you come down the bottom, and this is uh, taking into account the case mix and all the other factors such as age and ethnicity, if you come down the bottom of here and you look at the deprivation, you see almost exactly the same magnitude of h c between those living in the most deprived areas and those living in the least deprived areas. So you just need to think about this when you've got children within your clinic. So the recommendations from that audit, and we broke this down into recommendations for services. So for the service, each MDT should review their practice and the usage and outcomes associated with technologies in comparison to national and regional findings in this report, and I hope you're doing that. And each day, MTT should understand to take into account the potential benefits of pumps and CGM that might provide for children with type 1 DPs, regardless of their demographics. And services with longer waiting times for intermittent pumps should discuss those with their funding bodies and ensure a more timely pathway to initiation. So for networks, and there are some network managers here, these are the things to take away and think about. Discuss the variability in the usage of outcomes associated with the use of diabetes-related technology, and that should be added to your regional network me meetings. So you need to adjust, uh, put those onto your agenda and discuss the variability. And also discussions at regional and national meetings should be added to their respective agenda to establish best practice for using the support of insulin pumps and the insulin pump companies. Now, I haven't showed you anything about the, the, the companies, but again, there's quite a variability in who's using pump companies to start their patients off. And it tends to be, if you use pump companies, you're quicker at starting patients. And I don't, have we got any commissioners in the room? Not even the h -quip commissioners are they here, are they? No, can't see them. Uh, commissioners should note the potential benefits of this. So go to your commissioners and say, look, here's the data. People benefit th from this. I, I need, you need to fund this appropriately. Uh, and they should support services to enable timely initiation of insulin pump therapy once requested by clinical teams. So I'm coming towards the end now. That's it. So... This audit has come a long way to, since I started. Nearly 10 years ago, I started doing this, and I've lost most of my hair in that time. Um, but it's gone from that rather negative feeling back in 2010, where nothing was going, to where we are now. And Jackie Cornish, who was now the retired National Clinical Director of Children, Young People, and Transition to adults in the NHS, she wrote this about the audit. So this audit goes from strength to strength in terms of its quality of presentation, succinct summary, data collection, and national compliance, and remains one of our flagship audits. And that was praise enough from Jackie, because if any of you know her, it was quite difficult to get any praise. Uh, and I'm glad people are using this data now, and they get quite excited about the data uh, when it comes out. So I finally return you back to this graph and where we were um, last year with our h c on average 64 in England, 64 and a half uh, in Wales. Um, put your cameras down because you're not allowed to take photographs of this. Um, who, who's who's going to hazard a guess where we might be in 1819? 62? 66? 66. Okay, well, here we go. I just pressed the button and it should all work. And I've been great fun with graphics here, so I hope it all works. So, so yeah, well done.
I don't get a standing in a beach very often, but, but it's not me who does it, it's you lot who does it. And it's, it's really great to see that we've turned from that plateau, because Fiona and I were getting really worried about that plateau. So 61 and a half in England, 62 in Wales, pretty, pretty identical. But that's really good news, a drop of two and a half millimoles is amazing, that's huge in a year. Um, because of course we've got to keep it up. Um, so just, just to highlight those statistics, so you'll have seen this, this plot before. This is where you put children into the various targets. Um, so here we are in that data I've just shown you. So we're now up to about 35% of children with an HMC less than 58. And when I first started at that back here, I never thought that would ever be achievable. Never, I said, you'd never do it. Um, and that's when we were sort of using BD insulin and things like that. So these technologies have helped us massively. And the other good thing is those with the rather poor H1C, less than 80, they're now down to 40%, less than half. And that's really pleasing to see. So we're gradually left shifting uh, uh, everyone across to the left and hopefully we'll continue to do that. But now you've had your praise, I'm just going to, before... <laughs> Before Gunn takes off, I'm just going to compare you to probably one of the best performing countries in the world, which is Sweden. I know people hear me say that all, all the time. Sorry, Fiona, I forgot to put the A correctly at the top there. Um, but this, this is what has happened in Sweden since the year 2000. This is their HbA1c. Uh, you can see it's gradually trickled down and down and down. They again had a little bit of a plateau, a little bit like us here. This is where they... Uh, introduce their quality improvement collaborative program, which is what we went to, over to Sweden a few years ago and brought back to this country and got a lot of ideas of how to improve. And then down they came again and are still going, I mean, there's a point at which you can't improve anymore, but they're still going down year, uh, year on year. So if we just plot the UK data or the England and Wales data onto that graph, this is where we sit. So um, England in red, Wales in the green, we can see tremendous improvements, but we still sit quite a way above um, the Swedish model. And in fact, if you take this back, so we've reached where they were in about 2012. So we're about seven or eight years um, behind. But I think if we carry on, on this sort of trajectory, in five years, we should have caught them up. That's assuming they don't keep improving. <laughs> bit of a pain. They do keep getting better all the time. So I've just got three quick conclusions. So I think increased workforce is working. You need to just consider how you best utilise that and utilise your resources. Uh, increasing use of the technologies, that's improving outcomes. The QI, QA work is important, and I think the evidence that it might be beginning to show some signs of improvement. Uh, and just to thank all those people at the college, particularly Holly, who holds us all together in the team. It's a small team up here, people at the college, and lots of other people who help on the project boards and the methodology groups, and of course the QIQA team uh, over on this side. So thank you very much and well done. Yeah.